it's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card gives you unlimited cash back every day on every purchase. It's real cash you can spend right away. No need to wait and wait for rewards. Apply now on the Wallet app on iPhone to see your credit limit offer with no impact to your credit score. Subject to credit approval. Daily cash is available via an Apple Cash Card or as a statement credit. See Apple Card customer agreement for terms and conditions. Apple Cash Card is issued by Green Dot Bank, member FDIC. Accepting an Apple Card after your application is approved will result in a hard inquiry, which may impact your credit score. The following podcast contains explicit language. Hide your children. Hi, I'm Josh Levine, Slate's national editor, and this is Hang Up and Listen for the week of January 10th, 2023. On this week's show, we'll talk about Georgia's win over TCU and the college football national championship game. Both teams played hard. We'll also discuss Damar Hamlin's remarkable recovery and how the NFL has tried to move on from his near death on the field. And we'll pour over an internal rift in U.S. men's soccer involving the coach, a star player, the player's parents, and a domestic violence allegation from 30 years ago. I'm in Washington, D.C., and I'm the author of The Queen and the host of the podcast One Year. Joining me from D.C. is Stefan Fatsis. He's the author of the books Wild and Outside, Word Freak, and A Few Seconds of Panic. Hello, Stefan. Hey, Josh. And also with us is a man who just changed his Twitter avatar to Herschel Walker, holding a Georgia helmet. It's Joel Anderson, the host of Slow Burn Seasons 3 and 6. Hello, Joel. Hey. <laughs> in our Slate Plus segment... We're going to talk about uh, the NFL, actually. Um, so we're going to go long on DeMar Hamlin. But um, in the bonus, if you want to hear about Aaron Rodgers not making the playoffs, that's the spot. To hear that segment, you need to be a Slate Plus member. And you get bonus segments on this and other Slate shows. You get some ad-free podcasts as well. You get to support us. It's uh, a good thing to do. Slate.com slash hangup plus. That's Slate.com slash hangup plus. <laughs> Secretariat by 31 lengths at the Belmont Stakes. Tiger Woods by 15 strokes at the U.S. Open. Joel Anderson against the other 10-year-olds in America. Mike Tyson (laughs) over Michael Spinks in 91 seconds. UNLV 103, Duke 73 in the NCAA title game. 49ers 55, Broncos 10 in the Super Bowl. Chicago 73, Washington 0 in the NFL championship game. And now, Monday night at SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles. There are a lot of ways to slice and dice the numbers to try to get uh, what happened in the college football playoff national championship game. But how about this? The second half in which Georgia outscored TCU 27 to 0 was actually the more competitive one on the scoreboard. Joel, the final score was 65 to 7. How did it feel to be on the other side of one of the biggest blowouts in American sports history? Well, I mean, you know, you're a Mets fan, so I mean, you know, <laughs> you know what it's like to lose uh, in you know catastrophic fashion, but we, under, with... we understand. That <laughs> I'm lashing out. You're lashing, lashing out. out. We love I'm you, Joel. Out. You know we yeah. we kid because we care. <laughs> you know it's, this is a safe space for us to troll you. <laughs> <laughs> is it safe? Is it? Um, well, so look. I mean, that was pretty much uh, <laughs> the nightmare. Like that's every everything. When you're thinking about playing Georgia, and I did not want to play Georgia in the playoffs, and I said it. You were on record. You were on record. I was like, I do not want to play Georgia, Um, but there's no way around it if you beat Michigan, right? And so you think of all the different ways that things can happen. And early on, I was just like, man, I just, I can't envision any way that we win this game. Like, I don't know. It is, is the week goes along and people hype you up a little bit. And, you know, you just, oh, well, you know, Stetson Bennett, man, that dude was a walk on and, you know, you know, Ohio State and LSU th- were able to throw on them, and we pushed around Michigan. You know, maybe, you know, maybe I could envision some ways in which things are going to go our way. And then it happened. I'm sitting on the couch with my dad. Game hasn't started. They interview Sonny Dykes, and he says this little pregame thing. And then they interviewed Kirby Smart, and they're like, well, what do you guys need to do tonight to win? And he goes, aggression. And it just... 
scared me shitless. I was like, oh no. <laughs> like, like seriously, I was just like, oh no, we're in trouble. <laughs> was, um, and I don't know, I, I retweeted his pregame speech to the team. Let's listen to that. Why don't we listen to oh, Kirby's, oh, uh, Kirby's okay. pregame speech? Yeah, we do have that. Yo, yo ass is prepared for this shit for fucking 365 days. I think about them fuckers in that locker room. Think about getting our opportunity. All the shit you went through this week to get ready for this game, now is when you pay the fucking price. You go out there with energy, enthusiasm. Hey, now, ain't nobody in this room should be cautious. Ain't nobody in this room should be nervous about shit. Go out here and fuck their ass up. Don't think about the scoreboard. Don't think about shit. You think about knocking the shit out of them. Did you hear what Box said on Monday? I sat in that fucking meeting. I wanted to go fucking play right then. Throw your shit up out here. Two years ago, fuck your shit up. Goddamn pride and joy. Tell me you fuck these guys up. You're going to play the right way. You play the right way. You knock their ass off. You stay off the fucking ground. You tackle the fucking man with a ball. The shit's easy. Look at the right shit. Punish their ass on the offense and kick their ass on special teams, guys. It's about who the fuck we are. I believe in you. Let's go. Keep hey, that ball hey, ball. Hey. <laughs> Oh my God. What are we supposed to do I, with that? I, I mean, see it. Like, what, I mean, seriously. Like, I found an article from Psychology Today in 2012. Hell yes, the seven best reasons for swearing. Number six is self-expression. Swearing can be a way of signaling that we really mean something or that it is really important to us. That's why swearing is so much a part of any sport. Maybe we need to record a new explicit language warning. That's... <laughs> warning to everyone out there. Kirby Smart will be appearing on today's podcast. Shakespeare often used foul language, albeit more inventively than most. Away, you starveling, you elf skin, you dried neat's tongue, bull's pizzle, you stock fish. <clears throat> Why are you reading Sonny Dykes' pregame speech? That was, <laughs> that was, that was 11 <laughs> F words and 9 S words in one minute and se six seconds. So if you want to get into the analytics... The man is an artist. Um, and it, I mean, if I had been in that locker room, I would have been just so amped to kill somebody. But, <laughs> uh, as it was, as it were, you know, my team was on the other side of that. And again, like literally, I, I, watched, I, I had not heard that pregame speech, but I just saw that sideline interview before the game. And I was like, Oh, we're not going to catch some sleepwalking there. You know, you, you kind of hope that. Oh, maybe they're, you know, they beat Ohio State and they escaped with one. And, you know, I don't know, they they overlook us or whatever, but that's clearly not what happened. I think Michigan is to blame for allowing TCU to win. I think Ohio State is Alarm. to blame for not, uh, you know. For allowing Georgia not, to win. Yeah, for allowing Georgia to win. And, you know, how, uh, the thing that's like hard to reconciles that Ohio State was up by two touchdowns going into the fourth quarter. There's all these conversations about, and like Roger Sherman of the Ringer made the good point that like Georgia beat Oregon 49 to three and the opener of the season, everyone's like, Oregon is terrible. And then it turns out that that was actually a closer game than the national championship game. <laughs> but yeah, everybody's like, Georgia's so, ine it was inevitable. We knew that this was going to happen. They're so dominant. Um, but they like you know, would have lost to Ohio State if not for a, a missed field goal. They certainly were not complacent going into this game, uh, <laughs> Stefan. What did you see as a neutral observer? <laughs> <laughs> kind of scary neutral. what I saw. I was really terrified after, the, like, the second or third <laughs> simple drive. I mean, they scored on 10 of 11 possessions if you don't include the kneel out. How many drives of like 60 or 70 yards that took four or five plays did they have? How many drives of 80 or 90 yards that took 11 or 12 plays did they have? They kind of did everything um, except punt. They only punted once. Yeah, that was really terrifying. I mean, I mostly spent the, I spent the evening mostly feeling for Joel and intermittently texting him. I did text him after <laughs> the touchdown that TCU scored. Did you really want to hear from Stefan last night? You know, Chloe actually followed me for the first time <laughs> yesterday. My daughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah Stefan's daughter. And I was, I was, I was, oh wow, why she want to hear an old guy talk uh, about TCU football tonight? Sorry about the cursing uh, on on a timeline, but I mean, she's in college. She's, she's in college. But, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. she was very excited when Joel followed her back. She said. That's my biggest follow. And then she realized that her mom has more followers than Joel does. <laughs> yeah, I, I finished number two in everything last night. Um, but yeah, it, yeah, man, I, I, I didn't mind. I, I you know, I, I, I knew that there was a possibility that this could happen. I fear, like, again, like you fear, you don't, you don't want anybody to think that you're a fraud, you know? And I knew that we were living 
on the edge all season long. So this is where my skepticism, now I feel like it, at a certain point, people should like hear me out. I was like, I know that we're good. I didn't know how good we were. We caught a really good streak. We didn't hurt ourselves in ways that we did in previous years. And it allowed us to flip some close games that we had lost in the past. But if you ask me, do you want to play Georgia? I, I wasn't as afraid of Alabama this year, but I, I, envision, I, I can envision a scenario in which Alabama kicks our ass too. Um, but Georgia is just, I mean, that's not the best team I've ever seen. I can't imagine there's too many more teams more violent or deep. Like they have a they have a, a six foot three, three hundred and thirty pound freshman defensive tackle from really like literally right up the street from Fort Worth. And I'm like, that's the guy we need to compete against Georgia. And um yeah, I man, I'm just rambling. I'm hurt right now. Uh as you could you could probably hear it in my voice, but I'm still proud of my boys, man. Like, don't get me, I'm not, you know, I'm proud of them. We had a great season. Thirteen and two is unbelievable. People have heard about TCU all over the country. I wore my little TCU hoodie in the airport, and people are like, wow, congrats, good luck on your game. Like, you can't, I can't get that week back. One night won't change what happened this season, but um, it's kind of, <laughs> I mean, I told, I told, I told y'all about TCU all year long, man. I just, not, 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 I just hate that I was that right, you know? You tweeted right through it, though. You tweeted like a champ, Joel. You really took it well last night. Thank you, Seth. I, I, th- I like to think about <laughs> this is a, a I'm damning myself a faint praise. I'm a good loser. You know what I mean? Like, I just, I, you know, I'll, I'll take my ass whipping and we just move on, you know? Hey, man, Astros are the world champion, world champion, so. You, you can't know, pivot like that, though. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> All right, we, I, you know, hey, we might win the Rock. My Rockets might win Victor Webinyama. You know what I mean? So there's a lot to look forward to uh, this, this year. A serious question or not so serious question is, yeah. Is the golf, does this matter? Like, this ass-kicking is going to have everyone saying, you know, the golf between basically Georgia and Alabama is A, insurmountable, B, bad for the sport, C, inevitable, and just going to get even more accelerated going forward. This obsession with Alabama, like even with Georgia, just destroys the field. So is Georgia and Alabama in the same breath? Alabama, Alabama. The recent ones before that. Alabama. Six out of 12, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Look at that. So just won't get in the crowd. You know. So the thing is, like, what? You, what do they say? You grant, you gain credibility by the inch and lose it by the mile. Um, it'll be a long time before people believe in not only TCU but whoever the Big Twelve champion is if they ever get on that stage again. And that could hurt. But the problem is that we're well, not the problem. The solution to that is that the playoff is going to be expanded. So you know. All those teams are going to get a shot anyway, but in terms of like voting and perception, that's going to be really tough to get over. Like if you were a recruit, if you're a top five star recruit last night and you watched that game, it looked a hell of a lot more fun to play for Georgia uh, than it did TCU. And I don't know how you get that 65 to 7 out of a five star recruit's head when they've got all those kind of options in front of them, right? But that's a good point. The reputational stuff mattered more in college football than any other sport um, because even, and whether it's the bowl era or the BCS era or the four team playoff era, the f- results on the field could only take you so far. You had to actually impress people. And a lot of what impressed people was the, you know, the helmet and the uniform and the, you know, the history of the school. And that matters less now, but, but you're exactly right that it will matter with recruits. So in, in some sense, it's more of an even playing field than it's ever been. But in another, perhaps more accurate sense, it's going to get less and less even with the Big Ten and the SEC swallowing up. You know, we haven't mentioned USC and UCLA to the Big Ten, um, swallowing up the most storied programs, the most TV money. So we're going to get to see the gulf, if it exists, on the field every year at the end of the season. So it'll be fascinating to see how that plays out. The Stetson Bennett thing is also... Hmm really interesting because um, the story kind of has overwhelmed the player. I think more so last year when he wasn't the starter going into the year, he was closer in time to being a walk-on who'd had to go to a junior college in Mississippi to get playing time. And people assumed that that was going to be his last hurrah. He was 24 years old after last year's <laughs> championship, and he decided to come back and go for another championship at age 25, which he did. <laughs> um, and this was the first year. And even coming off the national championship, there were some Georgia fans 
who were like, eh, that guy will leave and we'll bring in like a more acclaimed guy to replace him, no big deal. This was really the first year where he was kind of considered to be good and like not somebody who was a fallback option or that you would replace if he had a poor half or a poor string of games. And in this game, Joel, like TCU got its ass kicked by Brock Bowers. They got their ass kicked by Jalen Carter. But they also got their ass kicked by Stetson Bennett, who didn't make a mistake all game, who was dropping dimes, who had SEC speed on those uh, mm. uh, those touchdown runs. Like, how should we think about this guy who has two national championships? So it's really interesting. Last night, um, I follow Mike Caven, who is the uh, director of football administration for Georgia. He's the old Georgia quarterback. He used to be the SMU head coach, too, when I was in college, and he, now, now he's back at Georgia, and just sort of a Georgia legend. And last night, he tweeted, I just want everyone to understand that Stetson Bennett is the greatest player in the history of UGA. And, I mean, man, I just it's just amazing how, how your reputation can take off for a win. Like, we thought, a lot of people thought Tim Tebow was a great quarterback based on the fact that he was surrounded by a lot of talent and didn't mess it up, right? And I mean, I think even Tebow was like more of a force in college football. And the thing I just don't understand about Stetson is that he's clearly better, right? Like he's not hes not what he was two years ago. He's playing with confidence. He's quick. He's got a good arm. He's accurate. Obviously his coaches love him. He must be really smart. But I mean, the narrative around the guy is just sort of annoying. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, I, I, I want to give him his props, but I just, we can't do this he's the greatest player in the history of Georgia. Dude, he's not even one of the five best players on that team. You know what I mean? And and that's the part that's sort of annoying because it really just, it reduces with all the efforts that are going on around him. It was the offensive line that was kicking our ass. It's the defensive line is amazing. And Georgia, I think, is underrated. Um, give credit to Todd Munkin, the, the OC. Oh, yeah. They're not, like, flashy. You wouldn't put... Like they didn't invent a new kind of offense, yeah. but the way you know they they do a lot of little things, like when they rushed out of the huddle and caught yes. TCU not all lined up, the yes. ways that they get the ball to Bowers on end rounds, and the way that they just took advantage. It was a really smart game plan, and just in, in really small ways, like not showy ways. Which, I mean, so, you know, Sonny Dykes has the Mike Leach connection and the Air Raid connection. And the thought is always that those guys are out coaching people, that they're able to bridge the distance between their slightly less talented team against the elite teams because they can scheme around you. And I felt like they got their ass out coached last night, right? Like, I mean, yeah, that little, that little huddle where they, you know, they caught TC off guard and hit the deep pass or, you know, like getting the ball to Bowers or just even the misdirection, just the stuff taking advantage of TCU's aggressiveness on defense and the little misdirection plays or whatever. Well, the, um, the, the, like, the Stetson Bennett touchdown where he walked in from, what was yeah. it, 10 or 12 yards out, 20 yards out. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, I just like it's it's one thing to have all that talent, but then to be coached in that way, like it's just click. Georgia is clicking on every on every cylinder. They've got all the talent. They're clearly developing their players. Like Stetson Bennett is better, right? Lad McConkey, I mean, we're not talking about somebody that's hugely talented, right? Physically talented, but like that guy is extremely productive and he's always open. That's that that that's not a five-star recruit they got. That's a three-star recruit they got. They developed him. He's a really good receiver. You look at the defensive line. So the thing that's scary about them is that I think they're less talented than they were last year when they lost 15 draft oh, yeah. picks and probably less talented than they'll be next year. Like yeah. their skill guys are not amazing. Um, the only two guys on the r- roster who are going, and I guess Bowers is a true sophomore. Like I think they have some like freshmen on the D line who are going to be amazing. Um, but like Jalen Carter mm-hmm. is maybe, maybe Keely Ringo on the defense are the only two players who are going into the draft this year here like that guy's going to be a star in the NFL. Like that's yeah. ridiculous. That right. like this team is not going to be depleted <laughs> by the draft. Yeah, this is a young team and I mean the thing is you know we talked about Stetson Bennett. God forbid they get a five-star recruit. Like let's say that they like they they get the equivalent of Justin Fields again and he stays. That's terrifying, right? So, yeah man, I that's the team that you sort of dream about having. I mean, obviously, you know, Josh, you had LSU a few years ago. 
Bama has had the team. I know you're you're upset that people mentioned Bama as a good program <laughs> too, but I mean you can't really run away from that. But if you're a Georgia fan, man, just imagine how cool it is to know. That, oh shit! Like this is this might not even be the best team in within this three year window, right? Like they may be the worst team in fact of this in this three year window, including next year. And that's got to be terrifying for the Vandys and Mizzou's of the world and the TCU's. And they managed to get away. Kirby Smart did all season with the everybody doubted us and, you know, <laughs> we're, we're, we're out to prove something. I mean, he said that last night. Everybody doubted them to start the year when they were ranked number three in the preseason and were never ranked lower than number one after the first week. <laughs> all you got, if, you can, if you can convince your players of that, you're a genius. Right. You know what I mean? And, and it feels like he successfully convinced them of that. And... Yeah, man. Hats off to him. You know, I mean, I, <laughs> I just, I, I'm throwing myself on the mercy of the court. You know, I mean, what do you, I <laughs> well, feel look. like I, I, I should, I, I should get credit for taking this really well, I think. Joel, this reminds me, you know, because we haven't, we mentioned LSU, we mentioned TCU 50 times here because we're talking about TCU. Reminds me also of Penn going to the Final Four in 1979 and losing to Michigan State 101 to 67, which you could have put in your intro, Josh. So, you know, I've, I've experienced that, too, in college sports. I just I don't want to be left out of this party. Yeah. Um, well, Penn, <laughs> I would have included it if they had made the title game. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, you definitely deserve a lot of credit for taking it well if you say, don't I deserve a lot of credit for taking it well? That's, that's, a, great, <laughs> that's, that's a great sign. But also, I, just to, you, I just have to point it out because <laughs> no, otherwise nobody else will. It, if it makes you feel better, you're definitely taking this better than I took LSU losing to Alabama in the title game. I was just looking <laughs> back. My friend Jordan Ellenberg uh, sent me an email after that podcast. Um, if people, I'm not going to go back and listen to it. If other people <laughs> want to as an exercise, please enjoy. He told me just at the time in 2012 that I delivered a monologue in that episode that would not have been out of place in the last act of a Tennessee Williams play. I don't know if you remember that, Stefan, but yeah, I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy, Joel. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, look, man, that, you know, we embarrassed ourselves on the national stage and people can joke about us or anything else, but uh, you know what? We were there and you weren't, unless you're a Georgia fan. And uh, (laughs) in which case, sorry, Uh, we saw, we saw, we didn't put on a better show for everybody, but we'll be back at some point in my life. I'm, I'm sure of it. Or your son's life. Or my son's life. Yeah, man. Yeah, I didn't watch the game with Desmond last night for the first first game all season I didn't watch with him. And uh, I got to think that that had something to do with it a little bit, too. Up next, Damar Hamlin, a week after he collapsed on Monday Night Football. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card gives you unlimited cash back every day on every purchase. It's real cash you can spend right away. No need to wait and wait for rewards. Apply now on the Wallet app on iPhone to see your credit limit offer with no impact to your credit score. Subject to credit approval, daily cash is available via an Apple Cash Card or as a statement credit. See Apple Card customer agreement for terms and conditions. Apple Cash Card is issued by Green Dot Bank, member FDIC. Accepting an Apple Card after your application is approved will result in a hard inquiry, which may impact your credit score. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average. And auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. 
Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the more than 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Six days after Buffalo Bill safety, DeMar Hamlin collapsed and was resuscitated on the field in Cincinnati. And two days after Hamlin was able to ditch the ventilator and finally breathe on his own, the NFL kicked off its final Sunday of the regular season. Around the league, there was an outpouring of support for Hamlin and his ongoing recovery. Home teams outlined a three in each 30-yard line number on the field in either Buffalo's Bill Red or Buffalo Bill's Blue. Before the opening kickoff in each game, the teams met at midfield for a moment of silence and then prayer. Players, coaches, and staff across the NFL wore love for DeMar shirts with his number three on them. And Hamlin even posted a picture of himself on social media, sitting up in a hospital bed and holding his hands in the shape of a heart. The caption? Game time. But it was in Buffalo, where Hamlin's team hosted the Patriots, that the day's tribute took on a life of its own. Naheem Hines returned two kickoffs for touchdowns in the Bills' 35-23 win over New England. After the game, Bills QB Josh Allen got emotional talking about what seemed to be a storybook ending to a harrowing week. I can't remember a play that touched me like that, I don't think, in my life. So it's, it's probably number one. What about the second one? It, it it was it was just spiritual, and I just I was going around and I just I mean I was going around my team and saying God's real. Like you can't you can't draw that one up, write that one up any better. Um, and I I was just told by Kevin Curran, it's been three years and three months. <sighs> Since the last kickoff return, so it's pretty cool. Stefan. A week ago, with Hamlin's condition seeming especially dire, many of us were wondering if football would ever be the same again. So how did the final Sunday of the season feel to you? Well, I feel like we were a little naive in thinking that things wouldn't get back to normal as quickly as possible. Uh, The league announced in the middle of the week that the games would resume as scheduled. And that's what the NFL does. The Kennedy assassination, 9-11, the pandemic. The league is especially good at staging spectacles that seemingly contextualize tragedy and also remind the public that nothing can deter this essential enterprise. So I had two initial thoughts during the week. One was charitable, that the NFL must have known more than the public that Hamlin's condition was improving because there's no way it would have risked playing these games while he remained in critical condition or even might die. The other was not so charitable, that this was a risk that the NFL was willing to take and it would just adjust on the eve of the games if it had to. But after watching everything unfold over the weekend, I think nothing short of Hamlin's actual death would have stopped the league from playing. And maybe that was the right call. The games created nationwide support, an outpouring of emotion, a torrent of indelible uplift for this injured man, catharsis uh, for the players to get back to doing what they do, and genuine and deserving tributes to the emergency personnel who saved Hamlin's life with their fast action. But in truth, it was the only call the NFL was ever going to make. Dwelling on what caused Hamlin's injury was never going to be the plan. Focusing on the positive story of his recovery and the support was. As my friend Drew McGarry wrote on Defector, the NFL treats its problems as things to be endured rather than solved. And I know that it's a strategy that has yet to fail it. So it went on pretty much unchanged. No one even bothered to edit one of the in-game sponsor throws, which jarred even me when I heard it. The NFL on CBS is sponsored by Allstate, reminding you that football is mayhem. The opening kickoff in Buffalo Um, We heard Josh Allen's response to it in in Joel's intro reminded me of the Steve Gleason punt block for the Saints in the first game back in the Superdome after Hurricane Katrina. And that play in the Dome um, was cathartic for the city and for Saints fans, including myself, because of the fear that we were going to lose the entire city than the fear that we were going to lose the team that we loved and cared about. And so there was this moment of kind of defiance of reclaiming that 
you know, larger patch of ground and then the dome itself. And people still talk about how there's never been anything like it that, that they can remember. And this was the one of the first plays that reminded me of that moment for a city and a fan base. The crucial difference was that it was important for not just the NFL, and I think we can't just lay all this on the NFL. Um, it's It was important for all of us because we've cast our lot with football. I don't know if you guys saw the chart um, of the top U.S. television broadcasts in 2022, <laughs> where it's all just little football icons. 82 of the top 100 U.S. TV broadcasts in 2022 were NFL games. And so not just for the NFL, but for America, it was important for the deliverance from this horrifying moment to come through football. It wasn't just enough for Hamlin to be okay. That game time tweet and then the fact that this moment happens on the field where it was just a beautiful and brilliant return and this outpouring of emotion around it, that it made everyone feel okay to watch this sport again and showed I, I think there's some truth to it. Like I just went on this long kind of, you know, remembrance of what that Steve Gleason moment meant. Like things that happen on the fields can move us to tears. Mm -hmm. They can bring this this out of us. And so I think there was some deep emotional truth to the response to that kickoff return, Joel. But I also think it did this extraordinary moment after this extraordinary week did then seamlessly allow the league and all of us to go back to normal. Absolutely. And, and that's well said. And I also think about how football injuries and recovery are always sort of reframed in the NFL and in football more generally, like Ryan Shazier, um, him learning to walk again is meant to be an inspirational story. I think about guys like Eric Legrand, um, the former Rutgers player who was injured in a game many years ago, or Chucky Mullins, the Ole Miss defensive back from the 90s who was paralyzed during a game, or Reggie Brown, uh, the Detroit Lion players who was paralyzed during a game, or Mike Utley, who, it, the Detroit Lion player who was paralyzed in a game in 1991, and his thumbs up signal has sort of become the go-to symbol for players when they're hurt and placed on a stretcher to let people know, I'm okay things can proceed, right? Um, th these guys and their injuries and their recovery from them are supposed to be meaningful and cathartic, even if a guy can't walk anymore. So, so we know that for these games to happen, we have to take these people who suffer catastrophic injuries and reframe them as heroes and inspirational figures. And we have to do that because we don't want to think about how bad it is, right? That Eric Legrand, uh, Mike Utley, these are people that are having to move around in the world with help for the rest of their lives. It's the only way that we can feel good about watching these games and moving on, right? So I was thinking about the returns and maybe I'm just a little off or maybe I, I, I couldn't quite understand it, but I didn't understand that those were moving until people said so in retrospect. I was like, oh, that, that, that kickoff return is pretty cool. And then people are immediately like, oh my God, that's amazing. That's for DeMar. And I was like, oh, okay. I guess if that's what it's going to be, that's fine. I think for me, I was more moved by the news that as soon as DeMar was able to communicate that he wondered who won the game. He said, did we win? Because if anything illustrates the differences between professional athletes and everyone else, there it is. He barely survived. He's hooked up to wires and breathing instruments. And he's, and he's still concerned about the game's outcome while the rest of the world is like holding on to its breath, hoping he recovers. So... Um, maybe it's odd or weird that that touched me, but I'm just thinking of a 24-year-old who probably played the game half of his life or more and never considered his adult life without it. And he's still thinking about the games. And it's like, in some ways, it freed up everybody else to think about those games. But uh, the issue is, are we going to be there for Jamar and his family when the games are over for him? Stefan, um, Damar Hamlin doesn't see himself as a tragic figure here. And this is, again, I think it's easy to say the NFL this and the NFL wanted that. Hamlin, in this ESPN story that came out after the game, it says he texted the defensive backs on the Bills at 2.31 a.m. on Saturday morning and wrote, I'm thinking about y'all. I'm sorry that I did that to y'all. He did that, you know, again, the game time tweet. Like he wanted football to go on. He was tweeting throughout the game and felt 
inspired and encouraged and wanted his <laughs> teammates to go on and keep playing. He didn't want the NFL to stop. Like there was very little that kind of broke through after that initial wave of just complete shock and the emotion that we saw on television, on social media, wherever, that all kind of went away, except, again, in that ESPN story, there was this quote from Tredavious White, um, one of his teammates in the secondary, um, who said, it's something that I can't unsee, him getting up, him falling. Every time I close my eyes, it replays. I try Mm -hmm. watching TV, and every time the TV goes to commercial, it's just the only thing that comes to my mind, just the vision of that. So it's been a tough week. And that was the kind of voice that we didn't really hear. There was a lot of talk on Monday. How could we have the players go out uh, and, and play after seeing that? Six days later, no talk about how could we go out and have the players play after having seen that. I guess after six days, it was like, all right, they can go out and play. Yeah, but you're assuming that, and I think Tredavious White lays bare the reality, which is that, you know, we want to assume, the public wants to assume that the players could go out and do this of their own volition. I'm not sure they necessarily all would have made that choice, Joel, um, even though playing is what they do and we want to support DeMar and it's cathartic and we want to give the public what they want to see. I mean, if there had been a choice made on you know Wednesday or Thursday, poll the Bills, poll the rest of the league, you know, probably would have come out in favor of playing, but there are going to be voices like Tredavious White's who allow the sort of reality to seep out and get beyond the veneer of the genuine love and outpouring and support and the sort of more traditional sports reactions that we saw all week. What I thought of when I read Tredavious White's quote was that it's like being a soldier. It's like seeing like the, the gruesomeness of war. It's like seeing someone killed in front of you. And, you know, I've said this before, and I'm not the only one to say it, until and unless you see a professional football game from the sidelines, you don't realize, like, how much more violent it is than what we see on television. And playing it, fuck. I mean, those guys have to sort of process it the way that, veterans process PTSD. It's PTSD every game. Um, So that was, you know, an incredibly moving and candid, uh, you know, admission um, that I have to go out there and do this while feeling what I'm actually feeling. Yeah, and I've I've got a real soft spot for Tredavious because he's from Shreveport and he's from a, like, for people who don't know, I lived in Shreveport for a couple of years. It's one of my favorite places. And he's from a particular area called the Cupper Road that is a really tough area. Um, It didn't, I don't think it had plumbing, (laughs) indoor plumbing until like the early 70s. But I was thinking about his quote there and we often talk so much about how players compartmentalize without thinking about if that's actually true. That they are affected by the world around them and they still perform. That's what makes them professionals, right. not being numb to the world around them. And I, in the past six days, seven days, you know, we watched a lot of former NFL players, you know, Booger McFarlane, um, Marcus Spears, Ryan Clark, Dominique Foxworth, so many, so many other, Dan Orlovsky, talk about the humanity in the game. And I think as much as anything, they were asking fans and people who care about the game to remember them as they are as human and fragile and more than two-dimensional characters on your favorite TV show. I mean, maybe you guys have a, a thought about this or whatever, but I just always wonder, why do they feel that they have to remind fans of their humanity? And I have a... I mean, I think I understand why, right? Like, I, I, I understand why, but I think they keep making it plain in these moments, like, hey, don't forget that we are human. Um, and I think it says something that they feel like they always have to remind us about that. We didn't really get into it when we talked about this last week, but there's something, I don't know if strange is the right word, but that in a sport that is just so relentlessly popular that there's no question that it's the most popular sport in this country, that this player who's now been the top story in not only sports, but in, you know, news, that the vast, vast majority of people in America didn't have any idea who he was before this. Hugely popular sport, many extremely anonymous athletes. And so I think that's part of it. 
I think race is a part of it. I think that um, the fact that they wear helmets is a part of it. But, you know, these guys who go out there to entertain us, there's the lead, the leading men, the stars of the show, and then there's hundreds upon hundreds of other people who are essential to the enterprise and kind of go out there in anonymity every week. And, and, and who it's worth pointing out, Josh, love this game for good reason. The beauty, the athleticism, the power, the strategy. I mean, these are the things I wrote about in my book. You know, the theme of that book was that they love playing on Sunday. It's everything else they hate. It's the risks and the fears and the pain and the monotony of the game that they don't like. Um, but playing, everybody in the NFL wants to play. Our, you know, my friend Nate Jackson, the former Bronco, had a piece, uh, wrote a piece for The Atlantic that published over the weekend. And in it, he wrote, of all the pain I had endured on the football field, nothing hurt as bad as watching the game go on without me. Wow. Yeah, that's well said. Um, something else that struck me on Sunday was that there was a lot of kind of discussion of who, who made the playoffs, who didn't make the playoffs. And one of the stories was that the Chargers were playing in a quote unquote meaningless game, that it didn't affect their playoff seating or the fact that they would be in the playoffs. And yet their coach, Brandon Staley, played his starters most of the game and some of them, including the star wide receiver Mike Williams, got hurt, potentially imperiling their availability for, quote unquote, the games that matter. Two things on that. Number one, this is all framed as like Brandon Staley was stupid. That was a dumb decision. Not as much framed as poor Mike Williams got hurt. That must suck for him. Yeah, sure, to maybe miss a playoff game, but also, like, he's physically injured. Like, that's not great. But also, it's like, it's a meaningless game. Other people are going to have to go and go out there and play and get hurt if the starters don't. You know, there are tons of games that happened on Sunday. Maybe not tons, but like Panthers, Saints, Bucks, Falcons, whatever. Some games that aren't in the NFC South that are quote unquote meaningless, where guys still go out there and potentially kill each other. Um, it's, it's some, that is something that we definitely compartmentalize. I didn't hear anybody talking about like really digging into the meaning of the word meaningless um, on Sunday. Right. We always talk about meaningless games and not really think about what that means. Uh, for instance, uh, I'm here in Houston right now. The Texans theoretically had nothing to play for on Sunday. And in fact, all the incentives would have pushed them to lose and clinch the number one overall pick in the upcoming draft. And instead, they rallied uh, against the Indianapolis Colts, and they had an opportunity kick a kick an extra point, go into overtime, stretch it out. They went for two and one, right? And everybody's like, "Oh man, they ruined it!" You know, this is a meaningless game. But this is where I'm like, there are a lot of guys on a football team, man. Th those guys, their careers, <laughs> the the eye in the sky doesn't lie. They're on tape. They don't. They can't guarantee that they'll be back next year. They have to still keep playing. The Demar Hamlins of the NFL can't take games off. There are no meaningless games. Um, every game has some value, even if it's just, I've got to protect my body. Like, I mean, it, you know, the way that I make money, uh, it, doesn't, it, it can't be meaningless. So yeah, that is always sort of a loaded term. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, we don't, we don't, I mean, we don't think about the DeMar Hamblins until it's that bad. But um, the, all those Hamblin list guys out there, they're playing for something, even if you don't think they are. And another story, last thing for me, another story that didn't really break through on Sunday. I saw this headline on ESPN, Rams player hospitalized with chest injury. This is a, another safety, another relatively anonymous player, Russ Yeast of the Rams. Pulmonary contusion was taken to the hospital, transported in an ambulance. Coach Sean McVay says, I think he's going to be okay. But, I mean, that guy, nobody's going to be, you know, at a, a vigil for Russ Yeast, or I don't even know what his number is. It's just like a <laughs> story that goes across the wire. But that guy's in the hospital, um, and we certainly hope that he's going to be okay. But that's just a kind of quotidian thing in the, the NFL that doesn't get noticed. Well, if you're going to play football, the way it's going to end 
is either they're going to walk you out or you're going to get carried out. And that's the vast majority of the players. So no matter how good they are, I mean, Steve Young, Troy Aikman, whoever, um, the game is brutal in that way and you're not going to escape it. And so, yeah, man, I mean, it, the thing is, it just most often happens to guys like DeMar Hamlin and not people that will ultimately remember. Okay, a little addendum here. Uh, after we recorded this DeMar Hamlin segment on Monday, uh, Don Van Natta published a piece on ESPN, kind of went through the events of the day of Hamlin's collapse on Monday Night Football. Stefan, what did we learn from that piece? Basically, what we learned is that there is an ongoing dispute between the teams, ESPN and the NFL, about why the game took so long to be called off. Don is reporting from multiple firsthand sources that a senior NFL rules analyst in the NFL's command center that it has uh, during games uh, conveyed this plan to resume the game to a guy named John Parry, who's a, an officiating expert, Don defines him, who is working with ESPN in the broadcast booth. So when Joe Buck... He's the guy who comes on the air to like explain whether a, a replay review should be overturned or something like right, that. Right, so the, Don's reporting is that Parry was in direct uh, communication with the NFL folks in their command center and was relaying the information to Joe Buck. So when Buck said four times that the players, uh, the teams have been notified that they'll have five minutes, the intention is to restart the game, um, that was coming directly from the NFL. The NFL denied that. Goodell, Roger Goodell, the commissioner, denied it. Troy Vincent, um, the senior executive for, for operations, denied it adamantly. ESPN put out a statement that is in Don's story that says there was constant communication in real time between ESPN and league and game officials. As a result of that, we reported what we were told in the moment and immediately updated fans as new information was learned. This was an unprecedented, rapidly evolving circumstance. All night long, we refrained from speculation. Uh, John Parry, the rules guy, declined to comment, but he did say the ESPN statement was accurate, and the NFL responded by saying that they were adamant that uh, no one relayed this idea of a five-minute five, five minute warm-up period to John Parry. John is just plain wrong. Joe Buck gave an interview to Don in which he said he was surprised to hear that uh, the league was denying uh, the intended resumption of the game, that it didn't come from them. Um, you know, this matters because what happened in that hour um, was important in terms of, as I said last week and again this week, that it plays to, it goes to the NFL's credibility, the NFL's crisis communications, and the way that big organizations communicate information to the public during crises like this. So I think it's an important dispute, and Don's, Don's reporting is deep, and I recommend reading his story. In our next segment, the U.S. soccer team and its soap opera. Time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card gives you unlimited cash back every day on every purchase. It's real cash you can spend right away. No need to wait and wait for rewards. Apply now on the Wallet app on iPhone to see your credit limit offer with no impact to your credit score. Subject to credit approval, daily cash is available via an Apple Cash Card or as a statement credit. See Apple Card customer agreement for terms and conditions. Apple Cash Card is issued by Green Dot Bank, member FDIC. Accepting an Apple Card after your application is approved will result in a hard inquiry, which may impact your credit score. Days after the United States was eliminated from the Men's World Cup last month, head coach Greg Berhalter spilled some tournament tea. Speaking at a leadership conference in New York, Berhalter described how he skillfully navigated a crisis, a player who sulked after being told he wouldn't see much time on the field in Qatar. As we discussed last month, Berhalter's dish went public and the player was easily identified as 20-year-old Gio Reyna. 
Back at his day job at Borussia Dortmund in the Bundesliga, Reina on Instagram apologized for his behavior and expressed disappointment that his coach made it public. Berhalter's contract expired at the end of the year, and U.S. soccer Twitter returned to discussing who should replace him. Then, last week, Berhalter announced that a third party had contacted U.S. soccer executives with information about his past in an attempt to take me down. Berhalter revealed that when he was 18, he kicked his girlfriend, Rosalind, during an argument outside a bar. The two reconciled and have been married for 25 years. Reporting quickly revealed that the third party was Gio Reyna's parents and Greg and Rosalind Berhalter's decades-long friends and former teammates, Danielle and Claudio Reyna, who first were mad about Gio's lack of playing time and then, because Berhalter used their kid as an anecdote. Josh, this is about as cringy as sports dramas come. A whiny player, a blabbermouth coach, vindictive sports parents, and undergirding it all, a small and insular sports culture. The only person I feel for here is Rosalind Berhalter, who's had to publicly relive what was certainly a painful private trauma. This would be funny if it wasn't so sad, and it is so sad that it's not actually funny at all. And I feel, actually feel bad for most, if not all, of these people. And there's a way in which there's something kind of like, this is, will sound over the top, but th there's a way in which it's almost like Shakespearean, in which a three decades old incident that's kind of haunted these people comes out at a, a time, uh, you know, it's... It, it's been known to family and friends and relatives of all these people and hasn't been made public. And it comes out now in a way that causes kind of maximum damage to everyone. Rosalind Berhalter has, you know, her victimhood splashed out in public in front of the entire world in the context of a dumb dispute about playing time. And it just sort of minimizes domestic abuse and making it part of this really kind of petty sports drama. So there's that kind of overlaying it all. But Joel, there's also something here that I think most, if not all of us have experienced, which is the feeling of betrayal by a close friend. And just the public nature of it, I think, is something we haven't experienced. But I think we can relate to having a deep relationship with someone and then something happens and then you never speak to that person again or you're not friends anymore or you don't speak with them for a couple of years. And these are people like Eric Betts had a really good recap of all of this in Slate that we'll link to on our show page. He described them as like best man at each other's wedding type friends. And so the Reynas, I think, felt the sense of betrayal from Greg Berhalter when he bashed their son in public. And it's easy to caricature them as out of control sports parents, but there are a lot of kind of templates that are being filled here. There's that one, but there's also people who are angry at their friends or feel betrayed that, you know, someone, Gio Reyna wasn't just a player. And that we can talk about the like kind of relationships in US soccer and how messy and it all gets with everybody being friends with each other. But like, Greg Berhalter has known Gio Reyna since he was born and they felt like he was treating him like shit. And so the way that it all kind of came out was unprofessional, certainly undignified. We can come up with all sorts of adjectives, but you know, when you get down to it again, Joel, it's about the rupturing of this personal relationship. Yeah, like you said, you feel bad for one or almost all of these people, and you're absolutely right. I mean, this is one of those situations where hardly anyone emerges from it with their reputation or dignity intact. Like, just imagine these names coming back up again uh, over the next few months and years, and this is going to be one of the things that we come back to. Um, no one covered themselves in glory here, though obviously the rain is probably deserve most of the blame for this spiraling out of control. And to your point, Josh, about um, this is a really close friendship, only a person close to you could betray you in this particular way, right? Like, it couldn't it couldn't be a stranger. Um, it has to be somebody that go, you go back way, way with, and it has to go really deep. And I think that's really sad. I mean, it's 
I think all of us can sort of relate to having a, a friend, a close friend, and that friendship falling apart and it just being sort of like its own little tragedy. But then to find out that as the relationship is declining or it's over, and then they wield this like particularly personal bit of information, it's like, man, what was it all for? You know, what, were they ever really my friend if this was, if they're capable of doing something like this? Yeah, Steph Young of The Athletic summed it up in a tweet, potentially re-traumatizing a DV victim, betraying an extremely private confidence, dragging an extraordinarily painful and personal history into the public, and weaponizing a system meant to protect people. For what? The Berhalters have four kids. (laughs) We don't know if they knew about this. Danielle Reyna and Rosalind Berhalter were teammates at North Carolina. Greg Berhalter and Claudio Reyna were teammates in high school and on the national team at the World Cup. These, as you described, Josh, are deep and lasting friendships, probably among the most, you know, serious friendships in these people's lives. And the impulse to go after Greg Berhalter in this way is just stunning. And yeah, I mean, you know, I criticized Berhalter for feeling like he needed to brag about this at some leadership summit when we talked about this last month. But in the context, yeah, that's a mistake. <laughs> that's, that's bad judgment on the part of a leader, assuming that something would be private when it was in a forum with dozens and dozens of people. But to bring this up, you know, if you thought it was disqualifying for Greg Berhalter to be the head coach of the U.S. men's national team because of this incident in his past, why did you wait? not just the four years that he was coached, but the 31 years since this happened. So the way you're framing it might be accurate. Danielle Reyna's statement, her perspective is that there are a couple of things that you said that are not accurate. Number one, she says that she brought up the Burhalter domestic violence incident to Ernie Stewart, who was a teammate of Greg Berhalter and Claudia Reyna, and also is now an executive at U.S. Soccer, that she brought it up in a private conversation that she didn't think was going to trigger any kind of investigation. And the reason that she brought it up was that she said her son, Gio, made a mistake by sulking in practice. He apologized to the team. It was over. Then Berhalter is like dragging his name in the mud in public for a mistake that Gio made that like in the context of like the world is not a huge deal when Berhalter, given his family relationship with the Reynas and also the mistake that he made, which was much larger as an 18 year old, that he should have extended Gio grace for that. And I can understand someone bringing that up to a friend. Now, not understanding that you're also speaking to someone who works for U.S. soccer. Yeah, that probably is naive at best. But thinking about it as a a human, as a parent, like I can understand where she was coming from. And I think I just hesitate to be too critical of the Reynas when I kind of see this as just a larger tragedy where, like Joel said, nobody comes out looking covered in glory. And it's also crucial to note that Danielle Reyna said in her statement that in Ber- Berhalter is minimizing what happened mm-hmm. in that domestic abuse incident. And there's going to be an investigation. And a lot of people knew about what happened. That's the shame for Berhalter now. Like maybe this was a one-time incident and his reputation has been tarred forever. Or maybe we'll learn something more. Maybe we'll learn that there were other incidents. Maybe we'll learn that this thing was, this one incident was so severe that it will color our view of him rightly. Um, And so, you know, we kind of have to wait and see what this investigation finds. But I'm just, yeah, I'm a little hesitant to say one person is the the bad guy here. Well, and, and and U.S. Soccer, in its statement on this investigation, said that it had separately uncovered potential inappropriate behavior towards multiple members of our staff by individuals outside of our organization. They offered no details, and <laughs> we don't know what that means exactly. But what we do know is that 
on the heels of the investigations of the behavior of coaches and executives in women's soccer, and now this investigation of men's soccer, you do start to think that, yeah, this is, as I said in my intro, an incredibly, and you alluded to, Josh, an incredibly insular organization. There just aren't that many people who get promoted inside U.S. soccer who don't have intertwined connections with one another. And as U.S. soccer thinks about what to do for hiring a men's national team coach, it kind of makes you wonder, maybe the best thing is to go outside of the bubble. And the bubble right now is players who are on the national team in the late 90s and early 2000s who have moved up the, ro- the ranks of coaching and administration. And maybe the smartest thing to do is to break out of this system where, you know, Greg Berhalter is hired in part by his brother, who's an executive at the U.S. Soccer Federation, um, and time to sort of operate in a more professional way that's less interconnected um, by these cliques and old relationships. I was kind of surprised that well, or maybe I shouldn't have been that Berhalter said over the weekend uh, in another one of those leadership. Yeah, he likes going to those leadership conferences. I mean, I guess he's cashing in, man, that he wanted to coach again. And to me, it seems obvious that Berhalter and Reyna can't be part of the same program, right? Like that seems untenable. And it really comes down to who you want the most um, if you're running the U.S. men's national team, right? I, it, like... If you guys have to pick, I mean, is it Gio Reyna, the, the young upcoming star, or is it Burhalter? who, I mean, I guess the thing about Burhalter is that you can think whatever you want to about the incident when he was 18 years old, that it's very serious and he needs to be held to account, that he was 18 years old and he reconciled with his wife and that that is what matters ultimately or whatever. But it seems like that guy being at the center of the program it, it just doesn't seem like they're going to be able to move on if he comes back and Reyna is still part of the program, right? So it's not typical that coaches get another World Cup cycle. And so if he didn't come back, it would have been kind of normal and expected. Now I think if he doesn't come back, there's going to be litigation. He's going to claim, I this is just, I don't have any reporting on this, but I would just suspect that he would file a lawsuit claiming that this, what he would label a scurrilous accusation or blackmail or whatever he wants to call it, prevented him from, you know, having this job and destroyed his reputation. It's going to not get any nicer or, or cleaner from here. And there's just like a segment of the fan base, a massive segment of the U.S. soccer fan base who wanted this guy gone, no, no matter what, just because they feel like he's tactically naive or, you know, they wanted a foreign coach or, or whatever. And so the ways in which this all kind of intersects with on-field stuff just makes everything kind of more gross and, and makes the whole thing that much messier. But there was this big scandal with Kareem Benzema who was the best player in the world last year, didn't play in the World Cup due to injury for France. But he was accused, and I think ultimately found liable by a court of law, of blackmail- blackmailing a France national team teammate over a sex tape. And he was off the, the French team for a while, but then he was back because he's really good at soccer, and the other guy was gone. Like, the thing that ultimately matters here is uh, in, in terms of who's going to get the opportunities is like the Gio Reyna is incredibly valuable in an on-field perspective. And Greg Berhalter isn't like, even if he's a great coach, like who the U S national teams, men's national team success in 2026 is going to depend way more on Gio Reyna than on, you know, even if they have the best manager, probably eh, maybe that's not true, but like Greg Berhalter, it doesn't, he, he won't, improve the team's chances in 2026 in the way that Gio Reyna would. Gio Reyna can play for the U.S. men's national team for three more World Cups, maybe four. His value to the United States advancing as a soccer nation at this moment in time is way greater than Greg Berhalter's. 
The other thing that I think people should be aware of, and this doesn't excuse anything or explain anything, but the thing that people knew about the Reinas before this on a personal level, beyond the fact that they were both brilliant soccer players and that they had this prodigy son, was that they had four children and one of them died as a teenager of a brain tumor. Grant Wall um, wrote a big feature about them, the family, I think in 2018. And it just seems like they handled that whole situation with love and grace and should be admired for how they handle it. It's That was incredibly hard on Gio. He wouldn't talk about it publicly for a really long time, his relationship with his brother, Jack. And so maybe that's also coloring my view that I don't want to see Danielle Reyna as a, a villain here, that she and Claudio and the whole family went through the worst thing that I think any of, of us could go mm-hmm. through. And again, handled it, I think, really well and with grace. And so I see all of this as kind of like situational and circumstantial. Like, yeah, maybe they acted like really badly, but I don't think that means they're evil people. I don't think that means that they're caricatures of sports parents. I just see this whole thing inflected with just like a huge cloud of sadness that I wish, I just wish it it hadn't happened because I, I think hopefully all of these people are capable of being great and humane and just this was not the circumstance where anyone covered themselves with with glory. Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now. And now it is time for Afterballs, sponsored by Bennett's Prune Juice, endorsed by Kenny Sailors, who says it was okay. So earlier we were talking about the gruesome theater of an ambulance coming out onto an NFL football field in the wake of DeMar Hamlin's injury last Monday. And ESPN's Adam Schefter said during that broadcast that it was unprecedented that an ambulance had been driven onto an NFL field. Unfortunately, fact-checked, there have already been at least a couple of incidents where an ambulance has come out onto the field just this season. But we thought back to some of the early editions of the John Madden football video game, uh, particularly the 92 season. And there was this feature where an ambulance comes out onto the field in the event of an injury. And that's actually probably an understatement. It... <laughs> It storms onto the field, running over other players. I remember doing this all the time with Randall Cunningham. For whatever reason, he seemed to get hurt the most in the early editions of the game. The website Polygon said that the ambulance debuted in John Madden Football 92 and last appeared in Madden NFL 2001. And some of the changes um, were because of the NFL's changing attitudes toward player safety. And in fact, in the mid-2000s, as Polygon reports, both the league and John Madden himself suggested that Madden's developers adjust the way the game treated concussions. And no tackles in the game will cause a player's helmet to pop off, at least in the later models of the game. So, you know, hey, improving attitudes toward player safety, although the ambulance was sort of, I mean... The ambulance was a cult figure in the game. Here, let's let's listen to... Yeah. Uh, a little bit of that for some John Madden nostalgia. Mm. Oh. Man, ambulance took out like four players. 
I mean, and it's it just it telling of evolving uh, attitudes or player safety. It's not like the ambulance even turns around to pick up those players. It runs over, right? But anyway, uh, for those people who really are into the music that Kevin has been playing, by the way, in the break, that is not his music. That was music from the video itself. So unfortunately, I don't think he can play that for us. But anyway, Josh, what is your Madden Ambulance? All right, replay reviews. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're bad. Actually, I think most of the time they're bad, but that's just my opinion. And I'm curious for you uh, to express your opinions, Joel and Stefan, on a review that happened recently that left me feeling very confused and unsure of what I think should have been done. So you guys are going to help me. We're going to help me process this moment. Here's the scenario. Uh, It's a men's college basketball game. Team A is up 61 to 59 with 4.7 seconds to go. I hope you're taking notes. Team B is inbounding the ball and has to go the full length of the court. So again, Team B down 61, 59, 4.7 seconds to go, inbounding the ball, has to go full length of the court. Let's listen to what happened. Reed will bring it up, the freshman, to Hannibal. On the way in, and we're tied. Did he get it off in time? They'll review it. They will review it, but I think Hannibal got it. So the announcer was right when they reviewed it. The ball was out of Hannibal's hands with a few tenths of a second left on the clock. The game was tied 61 to 61. We're going to overtime. But actually, not so fast. I think what they're reviewing is I'm not sure that the clock started when the ball was inbounded. That also was correct. The clock did not start immediately when the ball was inbounded, which was a pretty big screw up. It doesn't matter if you have a clock that has tenths of a second on it if you don't start the damn clock on time. And when the refs timed it out, they found that in real time, the play had taken 5.6 seconds. So that's nine tenths of a second longer than the 4.7 seconds that had been on the clock. Now, the NCAA men's basketball rulebook has a rule about what to do in just this scenario. And I should tell you that that rule was applied correctly in this instance. But I want to ask the two of you what you think should have happened. What is the fair solution here? And I think there are three options, but you can tell me if you think I'm missing an additional option. Option one, the basket counts. The player's actions were based entirely on the running clock that they saw on the scoreboard. And they would have had no idea that it started less than a second late. So the fair thing to do is just count the shot. Option two, basket doesn't count. There were 4.7 seconds left. The play took longer than that. The only fair thing to do is say the shot was no good. Then option three, um, forget, count the basket, forget, don't count the basket. Just replay the last 4.7 seconds. This time, start the clock on time, maybe, um, because we're in a fruit from a poison tree situation. The clock screw up makes both option one and option two unfair and illogical in their own ways. Uh, so what do you say? Stefan, you've been making a lot of uh, head movements. It seems like you have an opinion. Yeah, option three, clearly. The players who inbounded the ball were operating under the assumption that the clock that they were looking at as they were bringing it up the court and laying the ball into the basket before the clock expired was accurate. It's not their fault that the clock didn't start. They benefited, however, from the bad clock operator. Um, they should not be penalized for the bad clock operator's actions. Redo the play. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I thought I, first of all, I thought that was going to be the ridiculous option. Like, I just kind of, I, I, did, I didn't think that anybody would agree with me. So thank you, Stefan, for siding with me on this. But, you know, it's college basketball, so presumably this is a conference game. They'll play a second game theoretically, in the conference schedule. I'm t- just reading a lot into this. And so, you know, before the <laughs> second game, they can play that 4.7 seconds right before the first game. You know, they'll already be warmed up. They'll be right there, play that 4.7, and then get into the next game. Why not? Home court advantage, though. Oh, yeah, that's true. Hey, look, man, everything everything can't be fair. You know, we got to we gotta work with what we got, you know? All right, so what do you think they did? Oh, I think they disallowed the basket and then... The game was over effectively. Oh, I think they allowed the basket to count and just and, and we're done with it. All right. Under instant replay, page 107 of the rule book, when a timing mistake or malfunctioning problem occurs that gives the team more time than that team is entitled to, any activity after the mistake or malfunction has been committed and until it has been rectified shall be canceled. Wow. Okay. Basket no good. 
I know how to think like the NCAA. Just saying. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> sport then, then there's another mystery here. Why didn't I say what the, who the teams were? Because, oh, no, it's going to be a team we care about. It's going to be a team Close. we care about. Close. You're on the right track and the wrong track. The team that got screwed was LSU. Um, that was going to be my second guess. Yeah, okay. I didn't want to say it because then Joel would have automatically sided with whatever screwed LSU just to tell me. <laughs> but, but it seems that Joel actually was able to see through and understand the, the injustice was, that was committed. Actually, so mm. it was Kansas Poor State LSU. that beat up. It was Kansas State that beat LSU in a holiday tournament. It actually, it doesn't matter because LSU doesn't have a very good team this year. So it's not like there's going to be enormous implications. But I found this to be both in a kind of smaller sense and a larger sense, just completely wrongheaded and an example of how the like replay regime across all sports, just it's not logical. Like we've gotten to a place where the players on the court see the, the clock as it is, and they react based on that. There's not an acknowledgement that the like lived reality is the reality. Like another thing happened when I was looking into this, I found a, a game from 2016 that's even less logical in how it was handled. So this was Florida Gulf Coast against Michigan State in a non-conference game. There were 1.6 seconds left on the clock. Florida Gulf Coast was down by one. And so they had a chance to get this like huge upset over Michigan State on the road. They, similar to this game, had to take the ball full court, 1.6 seconds, kind of a long shot. So they inbound the ball, and this clock operator starts the clock as soon as the guy inbounds it. Like, the rule is that the clock doesn't start until someone touches the ball. So the buzzer sounds like before the, anyone even gets to touch the ball. And it was a great pass. The Florida Gulf Coast guy catches it and shoots it as soon as it touches his hand because he hears the buzzer. The ball doesn't go in. They then go and go to the monitor and they time it out and they're like, they disregard the fact that the buzzer went off. They're like, mm. that doesn't matter. They're like, it was 1.3 seconds until it touched his hand and then, and then he shot it and it didn't go in and there was no opportunity for a rebound. And so game over, Michigan State wins. Mm. It makes no sense. Just play, do the whole play over again. Yeah. Stefan. Right. I, I, I'm completely with you. I hate it. This is an exact scenario that I really dislike that ignores the fact that athletes, whoever, are operating based on what is in front of them, not some sort of externality that they can't perceive. I'm going to make a Scrabble comparison here. Wasn't expecting that, but also I was expecting that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In Scrabble, if a game ends um, with a margin of 10 points or less, you can recount the score and see if there were mistakes made, and that can reverse the outcome of the game. The problem that I've always argued, and I hate recounts for this reason, is that you are playing the end of the game based on the score that both players have agreed to in that moment. So you're making plays based on the assumption that I'm losing by six. I have to score at least 10 in order to get ahead to prevent him from you know, getting enough to go ahead of me by the end of the game. So it creates a sort of fantasy scenario when you're discounting what the players are actually doing based on what they see in front of them in favor of some sort of fantasy scenario where the refs are timing out to the tenth of a second in the case of basketball, what's going on or what would have happened on the court absent the malfunctioning clock. It's a good comparison, actually. Yeah, I, I, I can kind of sort of see it. Uh, this is very, I mean, again, this is Josh, Josh just trying to litigate his grudge here uh, for, in front of us. Um, but whenever Josh tries to litigate the grudge, he will deny that he's litigating the grudge, Joel. So. I just don't want it to happen to anyone else. I'm generous in that way. I just oh, don't. so unfortunate LSU. I hate, I really hate the, you know, for bad things to happen to them, Josh. Well, look, you know, when, when the team names were omitted, you saw the truth. And when... They were included. You were clouded by your bias. So I made the right decision. And we're recording this, by the way, this part of the show on Monday. We don't know what's going to happen on <laughs> on Monday night. Here's here, here's you what know. I'll say because you know Michigan fans were really were whining about the. Re I just that's loser talk. I'm sorry. Like I just don't you know play the game. You know I don't. <laughs> when I play, you know, I'm not saying that I'm like old. You know whatever. You know, I was some superstar or anything. But I was like, when I play, I didn't spend a lot of time worrying about what the refs were doing or the officiating. Just just play the game. By play the game, you mean that after the game is over, have the refs go <laughs> and review it 
and run like their little digital timer. Yeah, I, I can see that. That is our show for today. Our producer is Kevin Bendis. To listen to past shows and subscribe or just reach out, go to slate.com slash hangup and you can email us at hangup at slate.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the show and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. For Joel Anderson and Stefan Fatsis, I'm Josh Levine. Members, I'm Beatty, and thanks for listening. Listener.